All right, so friendly reminder that tomorrow is your last content-based test. 25 questions, all multiple choice. How exciting. Your focus and spice are due for the very last time. Some of you may be up late tonight for the very last time for your focus and spice. Make sure you hear that distinction, for your focus and spice. Um, so that is due tomorrow. That is Thursday. On Friday, you have a Baron's book due. Your Baron's book is due. Your Baron's book is due on Friday. I was talking to my husband this morning, driving to work, because he's in Louisiana for business this week. Don't ask me where. Someone ask me. I have no idea. Um, he's in Louisiana, and I, I was like, today is my last day of lecture. Be excited for me. And he's like, oh, God. He's like, does that mean Baron's book day is coming? And I laughed. I was like, you know Baron's book day? And he's like, yeah, it's like the worst day. You come home, and you're just raged. And I was like, oh, it's Friday. And he's like, well, shit. He's like, there'll be margaritas in my future, is what he said to me as a direct quote. So, I don't drink margaritas, so don't you dare think I'm only having a glass of wine in celebration. With that being said, you do not want to see me enraged. You can see how it already affects my husband. He's already planning his margarita. Okay, so please do me a favor and bring Dan Barron's books on Friday. On Friday, I'm going to lay out exactly so Josh will know everything he wants to know for the rest of his life in AP World for the next 50 days. I know. That includes weekends, though. So um, make sure you have that. Make sure you're ready to go on Friday. Then everyone will be happy. Isn't that all we really want anyway? On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the first African colony to gain its independence in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what is it, Nick? Ghana. Ghana. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the leader of Vietnam, the communist leader of Vietnam? Good. What is, who is it, Bruna? Ho oh, Chi Minh. Oh, is correct. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who believes in the two-state system? Uh, who is it, Bernstein? On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called? What's that word we use to describe the creation of the state of Pakistan? And it will cost half a million lives to put it up. What is it, Johnny? Partition. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the dude who commands, uh, commandeers the Suez Canal and rises into international prominence? Good. Who is it? Luke? Yes. Yes, sir. On your whiteboard, please tell me what colony are the French going to fight the hardest for because two million of their citizens live there as well as the largest importer of French goods. What is it, Katie? Algeria. Algeria. What is the name of the Algerian fighting force? Sincere effort in there. What is it, Elizabeth? Perfect. On your whiteboard, please tell me what country uses the apartheid? Ahmad? What is the name of the gentleman who is going to uh, dismantle the apartheid? Good. Who is it? Caroline? Nelson Mandela. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What are my four post-Qing dynasty rulers? Jesus is not one of them. <laughs> not paying pains to who's in power now. There's a dude before him. Good. Who is it, Karen? Sounds good to me. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is going to a fish. Uh, where are Chinese students going to be protesting the Chinese government, looking for more rights and more freedoms? Uh, but eventually, will be murdered by the Chinese government for asking for it. Jordan. Perfect. All right. So I do want to cover. Uh, a little bit of the China because some people didn't cover it in class yesterday and I'm recording so here we are. 
So if you open your notes, a lot of this, a little bit of this is going to be a little bit of review for you six period. So Chinese communist, uh, Chinese communism is going to need to be industrialized. So uh, our Mao Zedong is going to be industrializing. It's going to take him three attempts to do it. The first five-year plan is going to be an epic failure. Nothing good comes from it. Uh, who is the inspiration behind the five-year plan? Bruna. Soviet. Soviets. Who specifically? Stalin. Stalin. There you go. So we have the Great Leap Forward, which is a moderately successful which means they do get actual factories that are producing things. However, uh, about 60 to 100 million people are going to die because of collectivization, and collectivization is when the government takes over all the private land and makes it one big farm, and it's going to cause a famine, and tons of people die, so we call it moderately successful. And then we have the great proletarian cultural revolution, and that's when industrialization actually occurs. Under Mao, China is going to industrialize. They're going to do okay. However, under uh, Exo Ping, he's going to do really, really well because he's going to introduce pro-capitalistic. If you look at China today in 2019, it's a hybrid of communist government and capitalistic economy. And that is all by, done by this guy. Now, he says he's going to moderate Maoism. If we look at the Soviet Union, he is reflective in what Soviet Union dude? Kern? Khrushchev. And what did Khrushchev do? De-Stalinization. This guy is the same epitome. We talked about this yesterday. You need to be making those types of connections. That is what we're spending our whole time doing in review. So some of you are asking, what are we doing in review? What are we doing? We're making connections. We're crossing. We're, if I give you a name, you've got to give me someone else that's similar to it. Those are the types of things so, uh, that's your Chinese communism. Next, we're going to India. So, uh, you're heading to be India, please. You need to know, this is our eighth and final woman that we're going to talk about throughout the course of the year. I hope you're excited. Indria Gandhi. She's going to be a prime minister of India. I think she's like the third, but you don't need to know that. Indira Gandhi is going to be prime minister of India. And under her tutelage, she is going to do the Green Revolution. Under her tutelage, they are going to do the Green Revolution. And as Jordan did a very nice job explaining it earlier, the Green Revolution is increasing agricultural production. So we're making more food by creating better agricultural techniques, more scientific farming, and better pesticides. Now, why in the 1970s does India need more food? Makes logical sense, Sydney. Their population is booming, and they're not, they don't have enough food. When we think of India today, are we thinking they got plenty of food today? No, they're still having issues with famines and stuff like that, so it hasn't solved problems. It's going to start in India, and it's going to spread around the world, so please keep that in mind. Just like with every leader, there are pros and cons, okay? Uh, one of her, she does a really great thing with Green uh, Revolution, however, her big con is that she does forced sterilization, and you do need to be aware of that. What is forced sterilization? What is it, Johnny? Is it with, like, humans? Well, well, it's not cows, Johnny. I know. Um, forcing people to not be allowed kids. So there, yeah. Okay, so we're taking the ability of people to take, uh, taking away their ability to stop having children. Why would you do this? Why, Moffat? Stop the, stop the population from growing. Now, do you think they're going to pick the wealthy, most powerful people and do this too, or do you think they're going to give it to poor people? Poor people. Also, do you think this is going to have some regional biases? Do you think they're going to uh, put a ton of effort in selecting, or they're going to do broad strips? Broad strips, and that's where a lot of uh, discrimination is going to come from. What do you got? So does the Green Revolution only refer to the agricultural techniques, or does sterilization fall into the Green Revolution? Um, no, green revolution is one thing. Mm -hmm. The sterilization is the second component, but they're both trying to combat the same thing, though. The overpopulation is going to be a huge problem. All right, perfect. Now we're going to transition to what I have on my whiteboard. Okay, so I have things there. Uh, any of you in the back, like Bernstein, I have plenty of seats if you want to jump into a different seat. Moffat, uh, Luke, if you can't see, I've got plenty of seats. Or you can come over and take a photo of it and go back to your desk. I personally don't care. Whatever makes you more comfortable. So in your notes, you need to write Asia. Gustavo, move to a different yeah, statement. Right. Okay, good. So uh, in Asia, you need to know that China's revolutions give some women's rights. Give some has quotes around it. 
Okay? In 2019, do we think of China as the most influential uh, place for women to be? No, absolutely not. They're incredibly uh, repressive of women still. However, when we look back at the history of the world, what are the two most patriarchal places? India, India and China. So when we get some rights to women, we're going from China, which is the second most patriarchal place, and we make it just a little bit better for them. Now, does that mean we have equality of women in China? Absolutely not. Okay. So you need to know that it gives some women's rights, there are some social reforms, and there's rapid industrialization. Okay, so because of the reforms, the five-year plan which fails, the Great Leap Forward which is moderately successful, and then of course we have the Cultural Revolution which is successful, we have that rapid, uh, rapid industrialization. Next thing is called Little Tigers. Little tigers are Asian countries or cities that are growing up incredibly fast. They're economy-wise, of course. They're unstable, but they always recover. So they always... Now, here in the United States, are we a stable economy or unstable? Stable. We're very stable. Okay, we've had a couple really bad turns of the economy. Like, for instance, you can raise your hand and tell me the exact day the U.S. economy crashed. What is it, Sydney? No, not our economy. Oh. Our economy did take a hit on 9-11, but like, what is the worst day on stock exchange, Dan? October 24th, 1924. No, 29. Okay, October 24th, 1929, which is, of course, is Black uh, Thursday. So, we have very sporadic tanks of the economy. We had another one in 2008. Uh, 2001, we did have a definitely spike down, though, Sydney. Um, however, these little tigers, they go up and down all the time, but they always recover. You do need to know the four of them. It is Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. These countries are, for the first time since the 1400s, are now experiencing a time of wealth and a time of power. Uh, these countries are booming in economies, which anyone go to any like tourist locations, I'm talking about going to Disney World, going to Rome, going to England, France, you see a ton of Asian tourists, can we agree? The reason why is for the first time Asia and that specific region of the world is seeing a ton of influx of money and cash. So those people, for the first time, have the opportunity and the ability to afford traveling, which is why in the last 20 years, it's been a huge increase of Asian tourists and so sharply than uh, the previous uh, typical tourists. So if, you, if anyone's like, oh my god, there's so many Chinese tourists, first of all, they're not all Chinese. So let's be honest about that. And the reason is, is because of these little tigers, these little micro-economies that are booming. Uh, you also need to know that China is going to... Oh, did we talk about the one-child policy? No, I skipped it. So the one-child policy limits uh, is for the limiting of populations. You're going to see one child per family except for farmers. Farmers need more people to help farm. Obviously, more hands on deck. So they get to have up four to six kids. I can't remember. Now, just so you know, the one-child policy is no longer in practice in China. It did do its job. It did... Uh, hold steady the population. However, it had some uh, very negative side effects. What are some of the side effects of it, Jordan? Uh, everyone's yes. Why? Uh, because boys are like men are more like, uh, Okay, because it's a patriarchal society, so men are more valued. But why specifically men? They get what? Uh, it's not really the name. It's the money. Okay, name fine, fine, fine. Uh, I'm a girl, so I never grew up super attached to my name, so maybe it's a guy thing, but name's fine. But the money gets passed from father to son. So if you have only one child and that child is a girl, then all of a sudden all of your money, your, if you're the father who has all the money, goes to her husband. Is that necessarily good or bad for your family? It could be bad if you, your daughter married a pretty shitty guy. So with that being said, um, we're going to start having a lot of abortions to get rid of female babies, a lot of infanticide, which is killing a, a newly born baby, and you're also going to have a lot of adoptions from it. Now, the interesting thing here is here in 2019, in regards to this, in 2019, who has gained a much higher prestige in 2019 than they did 30 years ago? Women, because there's way fewer women of the marrying and uh, the, uh, in the fertile stages in China. So now, the desire for an intelligent 
uh, good bread woman is now in high demand, which gives women power. So that's pretty interesting on that. Now, going back down, China opposes the open regulation of the Internet. They want to limit exposure to Western ideas. They want to create a controlled culture state. It's called Wagoon. Okay, This is uh, a huge thing that you and us Americans would totally notice. When you go to China, or if you go to China, like for instance, Ren and I were supposed to go to China this summer. We obviously canceled because, um, I don't know if you noticed, but tension between China and the United States is a little strong. So if we went to China and you came on the trip with us, you wouldn't be able to use your Snapchat, your WhatsApp, your Instagram. None of that would work in China. Nothing. You would just have to take regular photos. That's insane. Like peasants, if you will. Okay? Like poor people. You would have to just take photos. And then when you got home from China, then you would have to post the pictures when you got out of China because they don't want any anti-Chinese propaganda. It is a huge thing they're trying to combat. Um, it is super highly regulated. So, um, Mi Ping, Mi Ch what's his name? What's the guy, the president of China? Oh, the chairman? Xi Ping. He is, uh, if you've ever seen him, he kind of stands like this. And he's just kind of an awkward guy, and he's got like kind of like a jowl kind of set here too. And he stands like this every time he stands. And if you look at him next to a picture of like Winnie the Pooh, he looks just like him. So in China, when they made fun of the president, they would call him Pooh or Winnie the Pooh. And so now in China, it's illegal to have an image of Winnie the Pooh. So if you scour the internet in China, there's no imagery and no references to Winnie the Pooh because it was used to make fun of the, uh, the chairman, which is hilarious. What a flex. Anyway, economic organizations. Now, it is really imperative that you understand that your economic organizations are used to regulate a global business to protect these people. Okay, The EU or the European Union is one of them. Do you think they give a crap about America or they only care about Europe? They only care about Europe. It is really important that you understand that these organizations only care about themselves and not about other people. They're their top priority. So the first one is the World Trade Organization, or the WTO, and it is headed by Western powers, U.S., England, and France. Now, who are the three most powerful country, uh, three of the top five most powerful countries in the world? England, U.S., and France. Who do you think, now all of these countries in the WTO who are headed by England, US, and France, they're the ones who are going to be deciding the prices of grains and shipments going in and out of the United States, England, and France. Do you think they're going to set it up for their success or for other countries' success? Their success. Their success. They're also the ones who are going to decide the tariffs on products coming in and out of these countries. The most, some of the largest populated countries and also the countries that have the largest buy buying power. So if you're a country that is not maybe so friendly to the United States, England, or France, how are you going to get, how are those terms going to look? Also, if you piss off any of those countries, England, France, the United States, they're going to turn the WTO against you, which means you're no longer selling your goods anywhere in the world. How is that going to affect your economy? Not good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on 9-11, where did the hijackers bomb? The World Trade Center, which is the headquarters of World Trade Organization. Ladies and gentlemen, when the hijackers bombed us on 9-11, they were bombing the WTO because it's the WTO who are going to destroy the economies of Syria, uh, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. If they wanted to bomb New York City, okay, just to show that they could, okay, they probably would have bombed more of icons of New York City, right? Like, could you imagine if they bombed the Statue of Liberty? If it's like she just fell over? Wouldn't that be... Could you imagine that imagery of like seeing the Statue of Liberty just like hunched over? If they wanted to show an impact on America, they would have bombed that. If they wanted to bomb the greatest city in the world, New York, they would have gone after the Chrysler Building, which is the number one icon of New York City, correct? They didn't bomb it. What did they bomb? The World Trade Center, which was the capital of the World Trade Organization. Why? Because of the penalties the WTO waged against, we'll get to that later. 
You need to know the European Union, which is about to turn into a shit show here in about three days with Brexit. They actually got a two-week extension, but it's still going to be a shit show. So, um, EU is going to be the strongest regional bloc, which is a bloc as a group of countries to protect the European trade. They only care about European trade. It's supposed to facilitate trade. We're going to see how important it is when it gets dismantled here with Brexit. The next one is OPEC. OPEC stands for Oil Producing and Exporting Countries, by the way. I know some of you are significantly further ahead than me. Hopefully you are listening to something I'm saying. OPEC regulates the reserves for oil producing countries led by Saudi Arabia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, your, every aspect of your life is affected by OPEC, whether you know it or not. Gas prices right now are really low. It's what, 250 a gallon? It's not really low, but it's pretty low. Um, the reason is, is because Saudi Arabia is driving down the prices of oil because they want to bankrupt Venezuela. How is that going? It's going really effectively. Saudi Arabia must be very proud. Saudi um, Venezuela is one of the few oil producing countries in the West, and Saudi Arabia is driving down the price of gas in order to bankrupt these Venezuelan companies. So when the, when the companies go bankrupt, who are they going to sell to? Saudi Arabia. And as soon as Saudi Arabia gets these Venezuelan um, oil reserves, guess what's going to happen to the price of gas? Uh, and there's going to be no way to kind of bring it down because there's three Middle Eastern countries that are now regulating OPEC. It directly affects us. Now we're going to talk about terrorism today after we finish these notes. We're going to talk about how Saudi Arabia housed and trained six, uh, four terrorists from, uh, from the 9-11 attacks. Have we ever punished Saudi Arabia for harboring and supporting these terrorists? Why? For oil. We can't really touch them that much because of the oil production. They're in charge of it. Other thing, we had, a, what, four or five months ago, the Saudis literally cut up a guy in their embassy, a journalist, who was printing anti-Saudi Arabian, uh, pro uh, not propaganda, anti-Saudi uh, Arabian newspaper articles. <coughs> what happened? Did we punish him? Why? If you've ever wondered why Saudi Arabia, if you criticize Saudi Arabia out loud here in the United States government, in the government, you can, I criticize them all the time, you can criticize, we're in a free country, but you don't see a lot of our U.S. government officials criticizing Saudi Arabia, why? Oil. That's why Saudi Arabia is as powerful as it is. Asian, uh, it regulates the Asian trade of China, Japan, South Korea, and India. Okay, Asian is going to be your regulation of that. If you love Trump, hate Trump, don't care. Uh, tra uh, Trump has spent a lot of time trying to get China, Japan, and South Korea all unified into a nice uh, trade agreement with the United States because Asian is the future of world trade. In the 1950s to the, about 2000s, Europe was going to be the big build of trade, which it was because they had to rebuild themselves. The future is going to be in Asia. So Trump is trying to negotiate his way into Asia. Next heading is Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union is going to collapse under Gorbachev in 1991. Reagan is going to put the final pressure on him. However, it's George H. Watch Walker Bush. Uh, George H. No, George. What's H's middle name? Herbert. Yeah, George. It's George H. Bush who's going to be the one in power when uh, Gorbachev officially crumbles. Uh, Perestroika and Glasnost by Gorbachev is going to allow for political discussion because there's going to be more capitalism and more uh, liberties. You're going to see that Soviet Union is going to crumble faster. You also need to know that all communist systems grant women equality. It's basic. No one looks at Russia during the Soviet Union and is like, wow, women really got it made there. Um, but they have more rights in a communist country than they do in a capitalistic country if you look at it all. Your next heading is global issues. You do need to know that the United States is going to dominate culture around the world starting right immediately after World War II. Why? Why? Dan? It's because we came out of World War II like the least on skate. Absolutely. So if you want a distraction from your shitty life in France because all of Paris has been completely bombed out and you go see a movie, who's the only country producing a movie? The United States. Is France producing movies? No. Who's the only country producing music in the 1940s? 
the United States because we're not rebuilding. Who's the only country in the world able to sell goods to the rest of the world? The United States. So all of a sudden, people are wearing um, American products. Coca-Cola goes worldwide because they have no competition. All of those different types of components. So now in 2019, do we still see the impact? If you got, like, for instance, uh, some of our big pop stars here in the United States, like Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, whoever else people listen to, okay, well, they go to, like, Korea, South Korea, and they sell out stadiums there. They can travel to Japan and sell out stadiums there. They can travel to China and, well, some of them can, not all of them. I think Justin Bieber's banned from China, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Because he made anti-Chinese comments on stage. Not allowed to do that. Uh, anyway, they can go and sell out all these places. Now, how many major Chinese bands do you know? None. Exactly. How many uh, French bands or musicians do you know? Exactly. The world knows our people. We don't know theirs. Now, we, like, for instance, in, like, K-pop, like, in South Korea, we started to hear some of their celebrities. Every country has their own celebrities and American celebrities. How many countries can transcend their country and come to America and make it big. Very few, but there's, I mean, Justin Bieber's Canadian. Uh, Adele is from England, of course, she's a huge... Okay, yes, yeah, so those are all English-speaking countries. Let's maybe diversify a little bit. It's very, very hard. Huh? Jay Belvin. Who the hell is that? There we go, okay, I got the reference now. Ricky Martin! You thought your generation, sorry. Anyway, um, it's very hard. Why? Because the United States culture is so suppressive, even still to this day. When we look at, like, superhero, the Marvel movies that come out, those are American movies. They're popular all around the world. How many times have you seen a Chinese film or a French Never. film? Never. You may have seen a couple British films, right? No? Yeah. A lot of people. Never. Step out of your damn boxes. Watch PBS. There's all British stuff on there. <laughs> Anyway, so water. You need to know that clean drinking water is a massive challenge for every single country, especially in the Middle East and Africa. Eventually, this will cause a massive problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know this, but the United States has really screwed over Mexico. Who here has ever been to the Grand Canyon? Oh, my God. People need to get out of your box and go see the damn Grand Canyon. It's awesome. Is it not? Yeah. It is really cool. Oh, what? oh, my God. How timely. Very cool. That was, like, so, so, so. Yeah. It's still, it's still like a nice view, though. It is very cool. All right. Where the hell were you? The Grand Canyon? It could snow in the Grand Canyon? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. It, I thought it was just desert. desert. I thought so, too. And then, like, the next day, like, I see snow. I'm like, I didn't That's know so weird. Snow. Anyway, we went to Vegas, and we drove four hours and saw it, and it was pretty cool. Anyway, so the river that carved out the Grand Canyon is the Colorado River. It extends from the Rockies all the way down into Mexico and empties out in what we would call the Pacific. You know, that little gap... I, it's not the Yucatan, Yucatan, it's on the other side. It's on the Pacific side. Anyway, it's supposed to connect. Well, with the Hoover Dam that we built in the 1930s, what river did we block? Colorado River. With other blocking, we took all of that water coming off of the Colorado River in order to divert it to American farms, specifically in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. So, what water is not, that water is not reaching Mexico. So the top northern part of Mexico used to be super, super plentiful, just like Southern California, which is some of the best farmland in the country. It used to be just like that all through Mexico, but if you go to northern Mexico today, what is it? It's a desert. Nothing can grow there. It's un, it's cannot uh, be farmed. Now, have you ever heard uh, avocados from Mexico? Yeah? The company who does that slogan and does it all is an American company. They grow avocados in northern Mexico. You know how they do it? They pay the United States government tons of money to take American water, send it to Mexico to grow avocados. Because the United States government has cut off water to Mexico. So they can't even farm their own fields. It used to be super, super prosperous. Now, if it was any other country, what would every country do? They would fight back, absolutely. They would declare war. But why hasn't Mexico declared war on the United States? They would not win it, so they haven't declared war. If Canada decided to stop the flow of some of their rivers into the United States, how would that go? That would not go well. 
Okay, Canada hasn't done that because we made sure they wouldn't do it. But in other countries, this is a huge problem. Chernobyl, you should have heard about this before, the largest nuclear disaster in history, uh, makes people fear for nuclear technology. Some kid was like, oh my god, my biggest fear is that there is a nuclear plant like 25 miles away from here. It's south. If you go south, there's one like 25, maybe 25 to 50 miles away. Uh, and she's like, it's my biggest fear, it's going to explode. Oh god. It's not. We've only had two major disasters, and we're within the 100 miles, so we would be affected, but uh, it wouldn't be that bad. Chernobyl exploded. It's in Ukraine. Uh, the water stopped pumping on it, and the rods, the nuclear rods, uh, were exposed, and then the whole thing explodes, and there's radiation all over the place. It's been completely evacuated. No one lives there. You can pay like five grand or 10 grand, and you can t put on your little radiation suit, and you can go on a tour. Like, during the week that the Chernobyl exploded, there was a massive fair. And so you can walk and see the Ferris wheel, and you can see, like, people literally just, like, drop popcorn, and you can see the, like, little containers. It's kind of cool. There's a bunch of dogs that live there that have, like, extra parts. That's cool. It's kind of weird. Anyway, you can totally Google Chernobyl. You'll see some <coughs> weird stuff uh, for it. You need to know that global warming, the U, uh, global warming, the UN is trying to limit greenhouse gases being released, and be uh, be aware that the Middle East becomes a foundation for competition between nations to gain power and influence. To the boards, here we go. On your whiteboard, give me my four tigers, please. Oh my God, I'm so excited! Today's my last lecture. Woo! Two more times. Ah. Yes. Good. What is it, Caroline? There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of my final Soviet leader? What is the name of my final Soviet leader? Good. Who is it, Marina? Gorbachev. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Who controls the oil crisis? Good. No. You need to know it's not Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia uses what to wage their control, Sydney? OPEC. OPEC, yeah. They use OPEC. But Saudi Arabia is in control of OPEC. But the prices of oil is controlled by OPEC and Saudi Arabia controls OPEC. So make sure you understand that connection. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when the, US, uh, when the Chinese government won't let you get onto your Snapchat so you can't talk crap about the Chinese government? Good. No? It's a, yeah. that, that's like a trading. It's like a oh, EU. I just, wrote, I just read regulates and I was like, yep, that's it. Nope. Nope. Should probably read a little further on next time. What is it, Josh? Wang on. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is one way China is going to uh, confront the population problem? Good. Elizabeth. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the greatest nuclear disaster in history? Good. What is it, Moffat? Chernobyl. There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the strongest regional block in the world? Good. I mean, it may not be after Friday, but we'll see. What is it, Luke? EU. All right, here we go. On your notes, uh, you need to write Islamism. Islamism. Okay, Islamism is Muslims becoming more increasingly negative about the United States, specifically in the Middle East, specifically in the Middle East. Islamism is the, the uh, Muslims continuing to uh, disregard uh, regard Americans in a negative context. Now, historically, from things I've taught you, why would Middle Eastern Muslims have negative thoughts about the United States? Why? Matt? Uh, just the mandate 
system. Mandate system is a perfect example. Post World War One, we carve it all up and we exploit it for go uh, gas, uh, for oil. What is another reason? Come on, people, think with me here. Uh, Dan, carving out Israel. Carving out Israel is going to cause two major crises. We have a refugee crisis, and we also now have. Um, a nuclear crisis, correct? They have nuclear weapons, no one else does, and they're obviously feuding with everyone. So this is going to cause a lot of already hesitation in the region about the United States. Do you think the United States is going to make it better or worse? worse? Worse. So let's talk about Iran. Iran is your next heading. Iran, okay, this is all you need to know. You don't need to get caught up with names on this one. In Iran, the United States want to remove an anti-American leader. In Iran, the United States wants to remove an anti-American leader and replace him with a pro-America leader. So in Iran, there's an anti-American leader in power. The United States is like, well, this isn't good. We should remove him from power and put a pro-American. Our lives will be better. Well... What happens? Yeah, it does not go well. We get caught trying to kill the leader. You need to write that down. Americans get caught red-handed trying to kill the leader of Iran. How do you think they feel about that? Imagine if, the le if Costa Rica came to the United States and tried to kill our president. How would we feel about that? Not good is how we would feel about that. So Iran Immediately, so the immediate consequences is going to be the Iran hostage crisis. You need to know that. The immediate consequences is the Iran hostage crisis, which 200, Ameri 200 plus Americans are held for two years as prisoners. They're sitting on the floor of the embassy. Okay? Now, we didn't get through everything I'd like to talk about. We did get through everything we need for tomorrow. Is that fair? Yeah. Now, this is going to lead to the United States putting a guy named uh, Saddam Hussein in power in order to go fight Iran. How does that go? Not well, because they high-five and say, let's not fight. Then he invades Kuwait, and we're like, oh, shit, Saddam, you can't do that. So we go in and fight Saddam, then we push him back to Iraq, and Iraq... And Saddam sits in Iraq for 10 years, and guess where 12 of the hijackers come from that bombed the World Trade Center? Iraq. Iraq. There you go. So. No. It's much more complicated, but yes. Yeah. You have all your content you need for your test, yeah. Yeah, you've got all the content you need for tomorrow's test. I hope you enjoyed our last lecture.